Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. At that time, if you would like to ask a question, you may press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the meeting over to Catherine Hambleton. You may begin. Thank you and good afternoon. I'm Catherine Hambleton with NASA's Office of Communications. Engineers are conducting final integrated tests of the Space Launch System rocket and the Orion spacecraft along with ground equipment ahead of the launch of the Artemis I mission. The agency will roll the combined rocket and spacecraft out of vehicle assembly building to launch pad 39B at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for testing no earlier than March for a final test known as the wet dress rehearsal. Here to talk with us about recent operations and provide an update on preparations for Artemis I are Tom Whitmire, Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development in NASA Headquarters, Mike Bolger, Exploration Ground Systems Program Manager at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, and Mike Serafin, Artemis One Mission Manager at NASA Headquarters. After a brief opening comments from our speakers, uh, we'll take your questions. You can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue at any time. Your phones are on mute now and the operator will open your mic when you're ready. Uh, when we're ready for you, and then close your mic after you ask your question. Uh, we ask that you please stick to one question and identify to whom your question is directed. Uh, if we have time, we'll take additional questions. Shortly after we conclude, you can listen to a replay of this teleconference online. So first, we'll hear from Tom Whitmire. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, and I'll try to make it quick. I know we have a lot of people online. We want to make sure we can answer your questions. Uh, first, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Mike Bolger and his team uh, for the work that they're doing, and our other uh, program managers, John Honeycutt, Kathy Kerner, and the primes that we're working with, Northrop, Boeing, Lockheed, Tosk, Aerojet. We have folks at the Cape right now that are working 24-7, three shifts a day. Um, they have a, a war room, and Michael Bolger will talk about that in a few minutes, where we get people together and we look at what the work is in front of us and how to move ahead. Uh, we've asked uh, Jim Free and I've asked Mike and his team to work at the right pace, make sure we take this a step at a time. Logistically, it's a very difficult thing. This is a 365-foot tall rocket that's 36 stories tall. Uh, Catherine and I live in Washington, D.C. The tallest building here is about 10 to 12 floors. So uh, when I visit Mike and his team down at the Cape, we literally get in an elevator and go very high up on this rocket, and we visit the different platforms and talk to the technicians and see the, the work that they're doing. At this point in the process, this is the part where we're closing things out and getting ready to launch, and there's a lot of activities associated with that. Some of them are unique to our rocket, and some are unique to the fact that this is a non-crewed test flight. So some of the things that Mike and his team are working on uh, is instrumentation, for example, that we fly on this flight to anchor our models to make sure we know how the vehicle is operating, and it's, it's a lot of uh, additional instrumentation we would normally not fly on, on a different flight. So. Uh, we get a chance to see that. We get the chance to talk to the technicians, see what they're doing. Uh, the tasks themselves are a, a, a lot of little tasks that we have to complete to get ready to fly. Uh, it's logistically challenging because we have different people involved in the different things. They have to have the right certifications. And so Mike and his team are going through that. We're making sure we do everything right. These are activities. Some of the closeouts we're doing right now, we won't have a chance to see the vehicle again before it launches. So uh, really, uh, Jim Free and I have asked Mike to really make sure we take this a step at a time and make sure we're doing the right work. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Bolger. But I just wanted to, once again, Mike, thank you for your team's work and all the hard work that's taking place at the Cape to get ready for launch. We'll have another update. I talked to Catherine. We'll probably do another update on where we're at in a couple of weeks so we can come talk to you again about this. Um, and in, in the March time frame, right now we're kind of looking at a mid-March, but I really don't think we want to commit to a specific date because I think we owe it to Mike and his team to compete the work, get a little bit farther ahead, we'll get a little bit closer to the final closeout, and then we'll be in a better position to, to target a specific date. And so that's what we've asked um, Mike to do. And with that, Mike Bolger, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, hey, thanks, Tom. Really appreciate it. Um, so let's see. I want to spend just a minute and, and tell you, you know, who who we are. So I'm Mike Bolger, the program manager for 
exploration ground systems. Um, and exploration ground systems, or EGS, we call it, is the KSE ground operations program for SLS and Orion. So I know SLS and Orion are the more familiar acronyms, but we're really that the ground ops leg of the of the three programs. And our, our team's mission is to integrate, process, and launch the world's most powerful rocket, the SLS, and then the you know the, only, the world's only deep space crew vehicle, Orion. We're also responsible for developing and sustaining the KSC launch infrastructure um, that enables the long-term Artemis program, so the launch pad, the VAB, the launch control center, the mobile launcher, and, and so forth. Um, we had a, a similar event in October. Um, at that point, I, I think I told you that the, all the flight hardware is at KSC now, and we've completed the assembly and the stacking of the flight elements in high bay three of the VAB. Like Tom was just describing, it's really a great site, um, and, and there's no better way to make your day good than to walk out there and, and talk to some of the folks who are really doing the hands-on work. Um, over the past several months, we've been performing a number of integrated test and checkout operations including the integrated power-up of the SLS and Orion. Um, we ran some modal testing. We had an umbilical re release testing of our T0 swing arms and umbilical systems. We had a countdown test of our flight software with our ground launch sequence. Um, we've tested our integrated communication systems, um, and we're currently installing and testing the flight termination systems of the launch vehicle. Like Tom said, um, you know, we're taking one step at a time. It's a first flow, and it's the first flow of a you know, multi-decade program to get us back to the moon, um, first woman and um, first person of color, and ultimately um, to you know, go on to Mars and explore the solar system. So we're really excited about it. We're taking it one step at a time. We're doing it very meticulously, um, and, and we're proud of the progress that we've made. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Serafin, and Mike will talk to you a little more about um, his perspectives. Yeah, good afternoon. This is Mike Serafin, and um, as the mission manager and the uh, mission management team chair, um, you know, when the, when the vehicle is ready uh, the, uh, and the agency accepts the risk associated with proceeding with flight, the uh, Ball will pass to myself as well as our operations teams to go off and execute Artemis One, uh, this uh, uncrewed flight test that will um, thoroughly shake down the space launch system rocket, our ground systems, our operations teams, our spacecraft as we as we go through a purposeful stress test uh, out into the distant ret retrograde orbit and then bring our spacecraft home at, at lunar reentry conditions. And I can say with confidence at this point. Uh, we are on track and will be ready when the hardware is ready to fly. Um, I've sat through a number of training exercises uh, with our with our mission teams. That's the mission management team, our engineering support in Huntsville, as well as Houston, and then the uh, launch, flight, and recovery teams, uh, including recovery operations that have been demonstrated at sea. Uh, we've got all of our analysis on track to uh, to be ready and pull it off the shelf when the uh, hardware is ready. And we are already entering our flight readiness review process to um, understand the uh, standard open work and the non-standard open work and the risk to proceeding with this mission. We've already completed uh, the flight readiness reviews for our communication systems, our flight operations team, and then the Orion spacecraft uh, just last week. And then next week is the space launch system rocket and uh, that will all roll up to Jim Free at the uh, agency FRR about a week before flight. So, again, I can say with confidence that, that our people are ready, our analysis products are on track, and uh, all of our mission preparations are on track, and we'll be ready to go when the hardware is ready. Uh, we are into uh, essentially proficiency training mode and, uh, and uh, working our way through our flight readiness review process. So that's it for me. I'll turn it back to you, Catherine, and uh, be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we'll now begin our question and answer portion. Uh, please remember to stick to one question and identify to whom it's directed. If we have time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. Again, you can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the queue at any time. And you can enter star two to be removed from the queue. All right, uh, we'll take our first question, please, from Bill Harwood of CBS News. Yeah, hi, Bill Harwood, CBS. Um, I'm not sure who it's for, but the release with the update this morning mentioned the flight termination system and and Mike Bolger mentioned it again or Tom did what it, what is the issue that or, or what are the long poles in the tent right now that made that prompted you to slip roll out for the wet dress in other words maybe some more details about exactly what it is 
you're trying to finish out that you couldn't have gotten finished out in time for a mid-February rollout. Thanks. Hey, Bill, this is Tom. I can start that, and uh, and then we'll let uh, Mike uh, Bolger and, and – uh, Mike Serapin talk a little bit more. First of all, you know, we have, there's nothing, uh, I would say, and, and Mike Bolger will correct me on this, there's no one specific thing. We just have a lot of things that we need to close out. It's a, it's a big vehicle. It's a, a lot of instrumentation that needs to be finished and, and, and prepared for uh, the final closeout activity. We actually go through the volumes, which is like the inner tank, the forward segment, engine section. We back the, you know, we finish up all the work that we need to do, and then we back the technicians out, and they inspect it on the way out. So those are the type of activities um, that they're currently going. I, I like to think of if you had a work being done in your kitchen and you were down to a punch list, we're basically down to a punch list of things that we need to complete. It can be something as simple as a scratch that needs to be polished out or some paint that needs to be fixed. There's just a lot of that. It's, it's a really big vehicle. And so I'll let Mike Boulder add to that. And to answer your second question, though, you talked about the flight termination system. That's just a test that we normally do. We do it on all launch vehicles when we get ready to fly. It's kind of a the range likes us to check it out right as, as, as close as we can to before we're going to go roll out. And so that way you know you haven't disturbed anything of that nature. So we, by definition, need to do that test towards the end. And we're working our way through the test now. But there's nothing going on with the test. We're not having any problems with the test. It's just the nature of how we do this activity is that that's one of the last things you do before you roll. And so that's really the only thing left from a test perspective. Everything else is kind of done. And it's really, uh, and, and Mike will do a better job describing it, Mike Bollinger, but it's, it's really what I would call kind of a punch list of a whole bunch of things that we uh, absolutely need to, to finish up, and then we'll be ready to, to roll the vehicle out. Mike, did you want to add to that? Or? Yeah, and Tom, that was, that was a really good summary. I, I can see, you know, I, I understand the question about flight termination system because we talked it twice. I, I think the, re, the reality of why we did that is it's the last of our integrated test and checkout sequences, and it's the only one still in front of us. We've actually already finished it for the second stage. Um, the core and boosters are going to pick up tomorrow. We don't anticipate any issues. It just happens to be that some of the work that's still in front of us. Um, beyond that, um, we're going to be doing volume access removal. So, in other words, we've got um, – We've got stands and, and access inside the engine section, inside the inner tank, inside the forward skirt, inside the launch vehicle stage adapter, and inside Orion. Um, and we're going to be removing that access um, before we roll. We're going to be doing booster closeouts. Um, we're still finishing up some of the installation of the instrumentation and the final ablative applications. Um, we've got a significant amount of paper we're still closing out, kind of dotting the I's and cross us. Uh, crossing the T's again, making sure you know we're we're completely ready. Um, the war rooms Tom mentioned were really the, the where we've got the engineers taking a look at the paper, just ensuring all the documents and drawings are updated and related um, released. Um, we've got some minor TPS work that we're doing, and then just a number of other issues we've troubleshot and are repaired, but we need to formally clear them for flight. So there really isn't um, a significant thing that we're working. It's just a volume of work, and it's us being really meticulous um, and making sure that when we roll, we're ready. Thank you. Our next question is from Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. Hi. Probably from Mike Serafin. Um, what's the minimal amount of time anticipated between rollout and liftoff? Um, what are you envisioning you know, from mid-March until what's the quickest you could launch? And will these latest slips potentially um, delay Artemis 2 and 3. Hey, Marsha, let me, this is Tom, let me start with that and I'll let Mike Serafin kind of add to that again in case I miss anything. And Mike Bolter can too. You know, first of all, you know, today we're really focused on getting out for the wet dress. Uh, and so that's the dates that we'll continue to share with you and let, and let you know how we're going. And Mike uh, described the, the, the logistical complexity of the things we just need to, to finish up to be able to roll. The agency as a whole, it would really not be, um, uh, you know, it, we really don't know until we do the wet dress rehearsal how much additional time it'll take to get ready to launch. We hope it won't be a significant amount of time, but really the purpose of the wet dress rehearsal is to see how the vehicle performs in an integrated fashion, all the way from, you know, the command control, the cryogenics uh, through the ML, things of that nature. So I, I just want to be, you know, clear that we, we really won't have, we will really want to see the results of that test before we can kind of be able to really uh, predict with a, a good amount of confidence the uh, period of time before we um, we launch. And so we would like to hold off and talk about that after we get to the wet dress. Um, in terms of, um, and, and, and really focus right now in, in getting the rocket out to the pad, because that's the last really big test we're going to do. 
And I, I think that, Marcia, let me, Mike, did you want to, Bolger, you want to add anything then? I'll also check with Mike Serif and see if I've missed anything in that. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. Um, I, and I don't know if, do you want me to talk a little bit about, you know, what we're doing when we get to? Yeah, yeah, and Mike and, Mike and Marcia, Mike can describe kind of physically what we're doing. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so once we roll out to the pad, um, well, you know, but the time between when we get to the pad and when we actually finish our wet dress all the way through um, the drain is, is give or take. It's about it's a couple weeks. So I say give or take a couple days. We're we're going to get out there. We're going to test the pad and mobile launcher interfaces. Um, we've got some testing that we haven't been able to run in the VAB on the flight hardware that um, we'll, we'll run for the first time. So there's some Orion RF testing. There's some guidance and navigation testing um, for both Orion and ICPS. And then there's some comm system testing that we really need to be outside of the building to go perform. So we'll do some unique tests like that. Um, we're going to service the booster hydraulic systems. Not that that's a a part of wet dress other than when, when you think about wet dress it's really getting the launch team together running through a complete tanking of the vehicle and then also a drain of the vehicle and doing it in you know the same environment um, as we're going to have on launch day so it really is a full dress rehearsal for the team and so part of that is servicing the booster hydraulic systems as well um, and so that, that takes us several days to get through that um, and so from you know kind of when we get out there to when we actually conduct that test we're looking at about two weeks And Mike Serpin, you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I think Mike Bolger said it well. The, the only thing I would add, Marcia, is that you know we do have some both well, some first-time uncertainties, but then kind of some standard uncertainties that that we know are out there. So the first-time uncertainties are when we roll out for wet dress and then for uh, for flight. Um, you know that'll be the first time we have the the full vehicle, the mobile launcher at the pad with all the pad services. And, you know, there, we've um, dry run that with just the mobile launcher in the past, but, you know, there's, there's a little bit of uncertainty on how long some of those activities are going to take as part of this first time, first time flow. Um, but then there's also what I'll call standard uncertainties. We've got to watch weather. Uh, we've got to have the right, um, the, you know, low enough winds when we, when we roll this, uh, 11 million pound mobile launcher with our with our rocket that's 322 feet tall out to the pad and then go up the uh, the, the ramp to the pad surface and then lower it so there's there are some environmental conditions that you know can cause some uncertainty in that as well so you know mike mike summarized the timeline but i just wanted to add that caveat as well that's it for me thank you our next question is from jeff south of space news hi um Curious if you have an update on the investigation into the engine controller that you had to swap out um, a month or two back um, and how that is progressing and if that is a constraint to either the rollout uh, or the launch itself. Thanks. Yeah, Jeff, I can handle this this time. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. We're going to actually, we're, we're doing troubleshooting at the vendor right now to look at that. We think we've isolated the cause of the problem. We're, we're waiting to get a little bit more information for you, then I will work with Catherine to give you actually a, a pretty good written description of what came out of the investigation. But right now we have been able to repeat the problem at the vendor. Uh, we've isolated where on the board we think we're at. Um, right now uh, we need to clear this because, uh, you know, it is something that we need to understand before we fly, but it's not a constraint to roll or wet dress. Uh, and so we think we have pretty good rationale moving forward, but we're just not ready to, to talk about that. We will absolutely uh, provide you an update uh, in, in I think probably a couple of weeks. I'll talk to John Honeycutt. It's on the SLS side. And as, and as soon as we're ready to share that with you, we will. But to answer your specific question, it is not a constraint to the role operation. Thank you. Our next question is from Dina Sinceri of ABC News. Yeah, quick question. How much has the current Omicron virus and supply chain issues affected you, if at all? Yeah, I can start with that, and Mike can talk a little bit. You know, of course, it's affected all of us, um, the Omicron virus in general. And I think across the country, I think if, no matter who you talk to or where you visit, if you go visit somewhere, you'll see help wanted signs. The, you know, workforce shortages are, are a real thing. The virus uh, puts us in a position periodically where Mike Bolger and his team, you know, has to take necessary precautions. Um, in terms of a specific, I want Mike Bolger to kind of give you a more specific 
uh, answer to your question. But I, I can tell you as an agency as a whole, and I think the other, other folks that we talk to, everybody's kind of seeing that there are some logistical challenges, just like you see at home, you know, when you try to order things or go to the grocery store. We see the very same thing where we have certain parts and availability. And, and, and from a uh, planning perspective, particularly for the things we just talked about, sometimes we have to change shifts or, or re refocus uh, what we work on. So. Um, Mike Bolter, do you want to add to that? Because I know you, you kind of work this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis on a KSC. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess I'll start with Omicron. Um, it, you know, yeah, that, I, I think that caught everybody off guard just by the sheer number of cases that we have to deal with. And so when you get a, a positive test, you know, then you kind of go through the close contact procedure. And, and so when it, you know, when it hurts is when it affects your touch labor workforce in, in the high bay. And we have had um, some instances of that. Um, we've worked through it. it. It has slowed us down some. I couldn't, I couldn't put a, a duration on it, but it, it slowed us down some. Um, I, I would say that, you know, just from an impact standpoint, the Delta virus, and you know, we're here in Florida, was a more significant impact. We had less cases, but um, it, it, you know, that one we were right in the middle of a lot of our key testing, and, and that one slowed us down some too. So it it absolutely is a concern. Like you pulled on supply chain um, materials, ability to get things, you know, on the timeline that you're used to getting them, um, has you know has affected the program. Um, but you know, it's a we're, we're a resilient team, um, and we're we're working our way through it. And it looks like we're starting to get to the backside of Omicron here, and you know, we're already kind of getting pretty, back pretty close to our our full numbers. So um, it, it's certainly impacted and affected us, but we're working our way through it. Thank you. Our next question is from Irene Klotz of Aviation Week. Thanks, Catherine. Um, uh, probably from Mike Bolger. Are there any restrictions on uh, operations at 39A when SLS and Orion are at Pad B? And also, could you give us the June and, um, I mean, sorry, the April and May launch windows? I, I think part two of that, I'll, I'll kick over to um, Mike Serafin. Um, as far as um, the, yeah, when when we're running, when we're actually flying, and I'm going to have to double check to tell you the truth, Irene. Um, but when when we're running our our key hazardous tests, it it usually does um, create you know a short duration outage at Pad A. Uh, I'm honestly not sure whether there are currently any planned operations um, for Pad A. You know, in the time frame that we're planning to be out there, so I haven't heard too much about it when we fly you know they'll they'll be standing down just like when they fly um you know we normally at, at pad b stand down so there is some overlap and some cross connect um probably would need to follow up with you to give you the, the real specifics of that though and mike i think you can probably better answer part two of that than i, than I can yeah hi irene uh, mike serafin so on the um uh, on the launch periods for april and may um, I'll, I'll caveat that the, um, our analysis process doesn't finalize the, uh, the launch date and window open and close times until we're about two months out. So the April info that I'll give you is, is pretty solid. May, um, we've got some uh, sharpening of the pencil to do as we go through our rolling analysis process. But the uh, April window opens on the 8th and closes on the 23rd. That's our last opportunity. And then uh, if we were to need May, it would open on the 7th and close on the 21st. Thank you. Our next question is from Eric Berger of Ars Technica. Hi, um, thanks for thanks for doing this. I, we really appreciate the information on all this process. Um, a question maybe for Tom or maybe for Bolger, I'm not sure. C can you provide some clarification on the status of the boosters? Um, I think previously program officials have said they're probably good to go through about July, and then maybe some more certification work may need to be done to extend their life date. Um, I don't understand all the technical details about that. but. Um, so is July kind of a hard date, and is that a concern for you as we continue to see schedule slippages? Obviously, you're targeting April or May, but, you know, there could be some issues with the wet dress that push things out a few months. So thanks. 
Yeah, Eric, this time I can answer some of the question, and then we'd be happy to also give, give you a more specific answer offline. You know, generally speaking, I used to do the shuttle program. We would run into this problem periodically with the shuttle program as well. We monitor the uh, period of time that we have the boosters in the vertical uh, orientation, and then there's some criteria that we follow that allows us to know uh, the period of time that we uh, can stand that orientation. Uh, what we would typically do, and the, this is for, there are other, other limited life items that we, we look at similarly on the vehicle, is that if we get close to that period of time, we begin the process of looking at specific data for the production of the hardware that we have at the Cape, and there's actually some measurements that we take to confirm this, and that allows us to extend the life um, further. Right now in the boosters, we don't really see this as a risk. Even if we uh, proceed further on in the year, we think we're, we're, we're in okay shape. We just normally don't do that extra analysis unless we, we have to. And that, that's true for the other um, hardware on the vehicle. Right now, we're not really looking at anything near term that we, we're, we're concerned with. We'd really have to be extended a period of time before we'd actually run into something that we think we would need to deal with. And then we would do the same thing we did during the shuttle program. We would look at the specific characteristics and then sharpen our pencils and do additional analysis respect to the actual hardware we have on the vehicle, the experiences we have with the art hardware, and there's some actual measurements we can take. So I think that's, I'm sorry, it's a, a long uh, answer to your short question, but right now we're not looking at any, uh, we don't have any immediate concerns for that. Thank you. All right, hey, next. Hey, Catherine, oh. if I could, this is Mike. I, just, I, checked on the, I checked on Irene's question, and, and just to kind of follow up and maybe close it out. So PET-A will be cleared during our launch ops. They should be okay during our wet dress. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Philip Sloss of NASA space, Spaceflight.com. Um, can, uh, I guess this will be for Mike Bolger. Um, can, can you um, talk about um, specific types of uh, instrumentation that are taking longer to close out? Um, I understand there's a, a decent amount of uh, ground test instrumentation that's going to be uh, on the vehicle for the rollout. Um, but is it, you know, is it ground test instrumentation? Is it development flight instrumentation? Um, is it on the boosters? We'd heard there were some issues uh, that that was going a little slower than um, than expected. Thanks. Yeah, sure. The the booster um, DFI is, is um, instrumentation that um, we are still working on. It, you know, that is one of the long poles to get us out to launch. It, it's not problematic. It's just taking us longer to get it um, all installed, and then to um, you know, we basically pack it in a mud or in an ablative to protect it. So that that has run um, longer than anticipated. And we do have other DFI um, on Orion and, ac and across the um, the SLS. So it, it's really just a, a more the the volume of work and our you know our first time working our way through it. Yeah, and let me this time let me add Mike's absolutely right. And when you see that roll out, you'll see uh, we have actually have a separate tray just for the DFI. So this is something we would do every flight in the future. It's strictly for this instrumentation. I, 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 Mike Serafin will have to correct me. I, I, I think we're probably the most instrumented vehicle ever to fly in the history of space. We have thousands of measurements we'll be taking on this test flight, a lot of instrumentation, a lot of harnesses. You'll see some of that on the roll. You'll actually get to see some of the uh, routing of some of the stuff. So it does take a long time. It's a, a commitment on the part of the agency to, to get this type of information so we can fly the vehicle safely in the future and anchor our models. Uh, but it does cause additional work to have all those instruments ready to go and and uh, you know in the future uh, once we're, we're in a, we have more data on the vehicle and how it performs through ascent and on orbit we'll have less instrumentation but for these first few flights we really are flying a lot of instruments on it and uh, it does take a little time to finish up that work thank you our next question is from Chelsea Goad with space.com Hi, uh, I'm not sure exactly who this question is for, uh, but as you have all mentioned, this is clearly a complex mission and the team is being meticulous, uh, hence, hence this being pushed back, um, you know, making sure that everything's right before moving forward with the launch. Um, but at the same time, I know that Tom, you mentioned there has been 24-7 work cycles and war rooms. Um, now, Artemis being a years-long program that will see many missions launch after Artemis 1, how do you see NASA striking a balance between adhering to hopeful deadlines and being meticulous, as you've mentioned? Well, I think that's what we're doing today, Chelsea. <laughs> you know, we, we agree with you 100%. Uh, we, we had, uh, you know, we were adjusting our roll date because we reflect on the fact that we want to make sure 
we have uh, people um, ready to go, and, we, and we're meticulous in it. Uh, in terms of the operation, Mike, and I'll turn that over to Mike, we, we, we have a lot of thought that goes behind that and uh, in terms of how we do the operations and separate out the work and make sure that no one individual is working uh, you know, longer than they should, that type of thing. War rooms are just actually, I think, a good thing. It brings everybody together on site and so we can all look at each other across the table from each other. It's actually probably not the right terminology. I have to come up with a better terminology. It's actually people coming together and, and really going, you know, leaders that we have in quality and, and engineering and things like that and actually going through the list and saying, hey, do we have this right? So I think those, those activities are actually good, and I think it will make for a better product. In terms of the technicians on the floor, I, Mike and I talk about this an awful lot. We really do care about them, and uh, we're trying to, to strike that balance. And I, I think part of our conversation today is part of us striking that balance. Uh, Mike, did you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. Um, it, yeah, because it's, it's obviously an important topic. And in, in fact, we were talking um, with the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel about you know exactly that last week and I was kind of talking about you know we understood how important it was how important it is that we get this first launch right because it enables the second flight and it enables you know the the whole 30 year program or however long it ends up being and the the ASAP chair said it said it really neat um what she said is you know if you miss your if you miss your launch date and you have a successful launch nobody's going to remember you missed your launch date but if you hold your launch date and you have an unsuccessful launch nobody's ever going to forget and I think that's you know that's exactly how we treat it um, and, and so you know so so given that you hear about war rooms and you hear about working 24-7 you know the, the other side of this is um, we you know we at KSC have it's always been viewed if you can get the flight hardware to Kennedy um, we're going to process it correctly and we're going to get it launched and, and we, we really take a lot of pride in our ability to process the flight hardware and to meet our commitments. We do know there's, you know, there are certain um, elements of flight hardware we need to keep an eye on, like I think um, Eric mentioned the, the booster life and, or the booster stacking time and so forth. Um, and and at the same, and we also know we're we're kind of getting to the events where you know people are buying tickets if you will people are paying a lot of attention and and so we're we're finding that right balance of continuing to push to get this launched as soon as we're ready but not before um, ultimately we're going to launch this flight hardware when the flight hardware is ready and when the team's ready um, and so you know always looking for that balance is an important part of what we do and I really do feel like we're striking the right balance. Thank you. Uh, we have time for about two more questions. The next question we'll take from Lauren Grush of The Verge. Hi, thank you for taking my question. I kind of want to build on uh, Chelsea's question a little bit. I'm wondering if you can maybe detail any changes that you're making as you go through this process to perhaps shorten the long gap between stacking and rollout for future Artemis missions. Thanks. Yeah, Lauren, let me just stop. I'll say a few things, and I'll let Mike talk about this, too. Um, you know, first of all, this is a unique flow for us. We're doing extra tests that we wouldn't necessarily need to do on subsequent flows, and so that's unique. Like we did a modal test, and we won't be doing a modal test again. So there's some unique aspects to this flow that are just inherent to the first time we fly the vehicle. And, of course, you know, we talked about all the instrumentation, which is kind of will be unique for the first two flights and then later on when we do an upgrade. Uh, and so those are unique things uh, that we've asked Mike and his team to do that do take a little bit more time to accomplish. Uh, and then we're also looking, and Mike always does this, as, and he'll talk about this, you know, we look at our experiences and say, you know, we need to adjust our timeline for this type of work and then other work, um, you know, there's things we can do to maybe um, become more efficient for the next flow. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's kind of, and Mike, let me let you talk some more about it, but I do think there's some uniqueness to this flow, and we, we need to, we, we kind of recognize that. And then also Mike and his team are, every day are looking for opportunities, and they actually build them in on an ongoing basis to, to be as efficient as possible. Yeah, uh, Tom, uh, absolutely. I, I think you, you kind of pulled on it right. Like we just were talking a minute ago about, you know, all the DFI that we're putting on, we won't have that same, you know, that same amount of um, unique instrumentation on a, on a second flow. We've also got tests that are only run for the first time through the flow, like a modal test, for example, and a number of the different integrated test and checkout procedures that we have. So some of it will come 
easy and naturally. Others will be, like Tom mentioned, learning the lessons as we go. You know, as we were um, integrating the Orion with the launch abort system, we, we were using a whole lot of scaffolding. We're taking a look at is there a simpler, you know, quicker way, that, you know, if we have stands in the building to avoid some of the time that we take setting up and taking down scaffolding. And, and the other side of it, it really is just first-time ops. I mean, it is new flight hardware. We've got new GSE. Um, we've got new software. And, and the team, this is our first time using a lot of this stuff. And so we're, again, taking our time and being meticulous. Now we've been through it once. We saw as we were stacking boosters, the process of stacking a booster the first time through, it got much quicker even as we got to the second and third segment as compared to the first. And we think they're really it. We will see some significant improvements in the overall timeline um, between stacking and rollout. Thank you. For our last question, we'll have Emery Kelly from Florida today. Hey, folks. Um, thanks for doing this. Uh, just to kind of real quick with the launch cadence, aside from SLS being what it is, I'm just curious whether it's, you know, hardware moving in front of the VAB or uh, flight restrictions or, or weather. What are some of the things that would, would cause you to need to pause work in the VAB or to do those affect that at all? Um, thanks. Yeah, Mike Wilder, I guess I, that there isn't much that causes us to, to but I'll, Mike, I'll let you um, answer Emery's question. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the neat things about our current architecture. We, you know, we do have the, the launch vehicle and the spacecraft in the VAB um, out, you know, out of, for the most part, out of harm's way from the weather and, and out of the, you know, the um, danger areas associated with other launch vehicles and, and so forth. We're not completely immune. Um, there are certain operations that we won't do if we've got lightning advisories, which of course in Florida, you know, are not uncommon, although this time of year they're not a big issue. This past weekend, um, we were somewhat impacted by the cold temperatures because the VAB is a really big building and it's it's not heated. And so some of the goos and the glues, we say, some of the things that are affected by um, the temperature, we weren't able to do some of that work. But for the most part, um, in the VAB, we, we really aren't impacted by what's going on in the environment around us, and we're able to kind of work our way through it. Thank you. That will conclude our question and answer session for today. Thank you for joining us. You can listen to a replay of this teleconference online by visiting the Media Resources tab at nasa.gov slash Artemis-1 later this afternoon, uh, and that's the numeral one. Artemis 1 will be the first in a series of increasingly complex missions that will pave the way for missions with astronauts and as we prepare for human missions to explore Mars. The SLS rocket and the agency's Orion spacecraft, along with the exploration ground systems at Kennedy, will be the backbone of NASA's Artemis missions to take human exploration farther into space than ever before. To learn more about Artemis and follow our progress to the pad online, visit nasa.gov slash Artemis 1, or dash Artemis 1, sorry about that. Uh, thanks again, and that will include our, conclude our call.